I sat in the car driving up here. Well, it's a, a pleasure for me to be here. My name is Peggy Kuhn. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. In the back? Good. I do have an outdoor voice from working at the Butterfly Grove. I have been a docent for nine years, and you're in an organization, and you know what happens sometimes to new people who come into an organization. They get tapped on the shoulder, and they end up being the chairperson <laughs> or the president. And that's what happened to me about nine years ago when uh, my husband and I retired to a Royal Grande. I knew I was going to work at the Butterfly Grove because I always love butterflies. And I went down to the Butterfly Grove, worked for a few months, and they said, we have a job for you. And I said, okay, what's that? And they said, well, you just have to put a couple of meetings on during the year, and it's called uh, the Butterfly Grove Coordinator. And I thought, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. I've done a lot of meetings. I was in the business world. And so I became the Butterfly Grove Coordinator, which was another word for, for chairperson. <laughs> and, um, it was two meetings, but they were very big meetings, and I oversaw everything that was going on with the Grove, including 75 volunteers for three years. And after that, when I was, you know, when you were the chairperson, the way that you get out of that job is to find a replacement. Yes. And so I found a replacement, and uh, they said, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd like to fly around and visit people in the community and bring the monarch butterflies to people who can't come to the Grove or haven't been there and introduce the butterfly grove and the marvelous insect, the monarch butterfly, to people out in the community. So that's what I've been doing for the last uh, four years. I've probably been to about 60 different organizations. So it's a special pleasure to be with you today. And I want to talk about the, the marvelous monarch butterfly and really focus on three things. And these three things come under the category of characteristics and adaptations that help the butterfly survive. So what we're going to talk about, first of all, is migration and overwintering. If these butterflies did not migrate out of cold areas, they would be dead. And if they didn't overwinter in a very temperate area, like the coast of California, they would be dead and there would be no more monarch butterflies. <clears throat> Other things that are very special adaptations and characteristics are survival behaviors that we see in the overwintering butterfly groves. Now, how many have been to the butterfly grove? And you've seen the big clusters, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Psychologists say all behavior has a motivation. So we're going to discuss a little bit about these behaviors in the butterfly growth and what the motivation might be. And finally, we're going to discuss the special relationship that this butterfly, the female in particular, has with just one type of plant, and that is a milkweed plant. How many have heard of the milkweed and how important it is to the monarch butterfly? Well, we'll discuss how that all came about, why it's an adaptation, and why that's probably one of the major disconnects to why the population has plummeted 90% in the last 10 years. Uh, the population has gone down so much that um, even the federal government and the state government is asking us all to do something to help the marvelous monarch butterfly. George, thank you. I've got a distinguished number. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about migration routes. First of all, there are two populations of monarch butterflies. And the monarch butterflies that we have on the west coast are called the western monarch butterflies. And they are divided from this big eastern population that goes to Mexico by the Rocky Mountains. That's a pretty good physical barrier. The monarchs could actually fly over the, the mountains, but why do that when you can go to Pismo Beach and hang out for the winter? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so we're going to be talking about our butterflies in this area. This is just the spring and summer area. We call this the reproductive area. That's where there's a, a lot of reproduction of butterflies is going on. And, several different generations. 
The butterflies have already migrated to this coastal area right here that you see, and we're in there someplace. And they're staying in the uh, overwintering area for about four months. I think the important thing I'd like you to know is that the butterfly that is here in the overwintering grove right now is the super butterfly. This butterfly flew to the overwintering grove, and that could be 50 miles, 100 miles, 500 miles, or 1,000 miles, one butterfly. Okay, no, no egg laying along the way. Now this butterfly is going to live at the butterfly grove, uh, any of the groves, for about four months. And then it still has to have enough energy left in late February to mate and for the females to go out and lay 300 eggs. So that takes a lot of energy. So the same thing is going on in the other side of the United States. But these are the butterflies that have the passports. They are the ones that are going down and overwintering in um, central Mexico. And there are some trees there called oil fir trees. And the butterflies are exclusively roosting or overwintering in those forests. And by the way, I have been down there twice. You have to climb up mountains to 10,000, 11,000 feet to see the butterflies in Mexico. And it's not a nat uh, nat national park or state park. All the property is owned by Mexican ranchers, farmers. So it's not the same as visiting a state park or a federal park that we have here in the United States as far as how it's maintained. It's a much more difficult situation to see the butterflies there. But they are down there. The difference is there's millions and millions of them. And on the coast of California, we now have fewer than 250,000 butterflies. They were counted in November. And we used to have 250,000 butterflies just at Pismo Beach. So that tells you that what has gone on with the population decline. Um, the other important thing is that when the butterflies leave the grove, the female is going to be looking for milkweed to deposit eggs, and then she's going to die. Another generation will start up. And there'll be about three to four more generations that move throughout this area, laying eggs. And these are very short-lived monarchs. They're only living about six weeks. So just important for you to know, there's no butterfly that makes an entire loop. The butterflies that are here right now are the great-great-grandchildren of the butterflies that left the grove last February, OK? So how does this butterfly know to come back? That's an interesting question, OK? Here's a little bit about migration. And you can see this perfect monarch butterfly sipping a little nectar with the proboscis. The antenna are forward because it detected the flower. And you see the butterfly with its wings closed. And this picture I took in Cayucas. And this was one of uh, 700 butterflies that were migrating down to overwinter, and they stopped behind a mobile home development to rest for a couple of days. It was just a little resting stop over site and taking in some nectar, some sugar water. So this is a migrating butterfly on its way. Now, the overwintering locations, uh, there are quite a few of them, uh, about 200 sites. Some of them are very small along the coast. Some of them are on private property, and we don't even know about them, and we'll never see them, but they're, they're monarchs all around. And uh, butterflies are counted at about 150 different sites every Thanksgiving. There's what is called the Thanksgiving count. And that's why we know how many butterflies approximately there are. These are all the counties that we find butterflies, from down in San Diego all the way up to above um, San Francisco. But I must say that we have a big concentration in San Luis Obispo and Monterey counties. That's where some of your big concentrations are. Okay. The overwintering sites where the butterflies roost and um, kind of act as couch potatoes for the winter have many different things in common. 
And if you've been down to the Pismo Grove, you know that it's close proximity to the ocean. In fact, we can stand in the Butterfly Grove and we can hear the waves and we can see the waves out there beyond the campground. Just about all of the sites share that closeness to the ocean. And what does that do for the Butterfly Grove? Well, we're having some of the warmest temperatures ever right now because of the El Nino influence. Our water is 57 to 59 degrees. Now that's still pretty cold in comparison to other places, but usually the water temperature at this time of the year is 52 to 54. So that big blue out there creates a blanket effect along the coastal strand where the butterflies are and some expensive houses and campgrounds and that area never freezes. And remember, these are cold-blooded insects, so if it did freeze at the grove, especially a hard freeze, they would all fall out of the trees, be on the ground, and I'm happy to report, and I should knock on wood, uh, when these butterflies were discovered in the Pismo Grove in 1940, we have never had a hard freeze, even a soft freeze. It goes down to um, 36, 38, and I've gone to the grove sometimes when it's been that cold and I run out to see if they're okay. And there they are, hanging in their clusters, having a wonderful time, and they're just fine. I live in a Rio Grande about three, four miles inland, and I've had the hard freeze and all my begonias are laying on the ground frozen. So the difference of a few miles in that proximity to the beach is a major uh, character, a major important uh, characteristic of the overwintering sites. Also, how the trees are grouped in the grove. If you've been to um, the Butterfly Grove, you notice that there's a big center area. And when the trees are in a rounded area, instead of in a linear, like a line, they, they, they touch at the top, and that creates a canopy, which reminds me of an umbrella. And it, that's exactly what it does for the monarch butterflies. It's interesting that, um, you know, the eucalyptus trees all along the coast were planted as windbreaks. And um, the monarch butterfly grove used to be an artichoke field. And so a lot of trees were planted there to protect the artichoke fields. And, but they are not in a linear formation. And what has happened is the trees are now creating a windbreak for the monarch butterflies. The big enemies for butterflies, all butterflies, are wind and bad weather, pelting rain, uh, hail, those types of things you can imagine. The nice thing about the Pismo Grove is it's quite large and the butterflies can move around from one area to another depend, depending upon the prevailing wind. It's big enough that they can use different areas. We have a water source close by. I don't know how many of you have noticed, but there's a little creek running behind the, the grove. And the butterflies don't really need to fly over and put their proboscis in the water. All they need is to go to a little damp area and put their proboscis in and sip a little moisture, um, you know, out of the damp area. If the creek didn't have any water in it, which it hasn't for the last four years, they can sip dew on the ground. So there's always a place that they can find a little bit of water. They drink water about every two or three days. It's quite a moist area, so they don't have to worry about drying out as much as the butterflies in Mexico. The, the butterflies in Mexico, it's a much drier area, and they have to find a place to drink water every day. Okay. Um, I just want to talk a little bit before we go on to behaviors in the grove about some of the unique characteristics of the butterfly, the monarch, and why it's able to make this long migration uh, to the overwintering uh, sites. Mexico is a 3,000 mile flight for one butterfly. How does a four inch butterfly do that? 
Well, the monarch has adapted to, I don't know if we can use the word understand, but take advantage of thermals. And it will ride the thermals up, and then it will soar like that. And while it's soaring, it's resting. Okay, so it's not having to flap its wings 60 times a minute or even more than that. Uh, so it takes advantage of the, th the thermals and the direction of the wind. When the weather is not good, uh, butterflies are for the most part diurnal, which means they're active during the daytime. Okay, if it gets cloudy like it was this morning and very cold, here you wouldn't find any butterflies out flying around. The flight temperature for monarchs is about 55 to 57 degrees. So they're not moving out of these clusters until it warms up at least to 55, 56 degrees. So another thing that helps them make these long migrations is the fact that they're kind of a large butterfly. They are about four inches across, and as you know, there's many tiny, tiny butterflies, and they have different characteristics. But because the monarch is so big, when it's flying, if a predator tries to bite it or eat it, it's actually, it's usually going to be from the back. And usually they'll come up and bite the butterfly here, maybe take a chunk out of the, of the wing. And we see many butterflies in the grove that are missing parts of the wings down here at the bottom. This is called the trailing edge of the wing. This is called the leading edge. Because they're bitten down here usually, and they're a large butterfly, they can still fly. And they can do everything that they need to do. They can do mating, they can overwinter, they can be in pretty bad shape. If they were bitten up here on the leading edge, they would fly around in circles. They wouldn't be able to do the things that they need to do. So because they're large, they're usually bitten here. But something else um, that is really uh, interesting about them, they've adapted to have a flight characteristic that is more similar to a fighter jet. So when something is chasing them, they can zoom ahead from about 12 to 25 miles an hour. So they can double their speed and they can do loop-de-loos, and they can dash in one direction and another. We've seen them chased at the butterfly grove, and they hardly ever get caught. Okay. Let's transition to these clusters, because these are a pretty amazing thing. Um, we talked about psychologists saying that all behavior has a motivation. Here's a behavior. It's a startling behavior because the rest of the time, in the spring and the summer, monarchs are solitary butterflies. We only see clustering behavior in the overwintering grove. Occasionally, we'll see aggregations of them in trees during the nighttime, or if it's foggy or cloudy or rainy. But this true clustering, we only see during the overwintering. So that's pretty interesting. The rest of the time, this butterfly is a solitary butterfly. There's just a lone male here looking for a lone male, female over here during the spring and the summer. That's why they're difficult to count during the spring and the summer, because they're, they're, far, they're, they're spread far apart. We can count them a little bit more easily when they're in the clusters. So why don't you give me your ideas of what you think is the motivation of these butterflies be behind the clustering. What does the clustering do for butterflies, do you think? Yes? Keeps them warm. For Keeps them warm. Okay. <coughs> Who else? Protection from the weather. Protection from the weather, absolutely. Any other thoughts? Protection from predators. because there's so many together, your chance of being able to Excellent. Very, very good. good. Any other yes. thoughts? Well, let's deal with the warp first of all. We know they're cold-blooded. Um, insects and um, they, they really probably don't warm up. We actually had a researcher put a thermometer in a big cluster and we, when he took it out it was the same temperature as the air all around. But someone else said, um, you know, how they're hidden, how, because what do they look like in this cluster? Leaves. So if you were a bird or a predator and you were looking for an individual butterfly, okay, you would fly right by this cluster. 
The other thing is, these butterflies have their wings closed. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing the drab color. We're seeing a little of the bright colors, but we're seeing basically the drab colors. I'll have some other examples, too. And um, a bird would fly right by this. In fact, even those of us who work in the grove, when the butterflies move around from one week to the next, and I go out to look for them, I really have to look to find them if they moved because they're well camouflaged. This is called camouflage or protective coloration. And all, most butterflies have this, um, a bright color when they open their wings and a drab color when they close their wings. So this is the resting position for the monarch butterfly. Some butterflies rest with their wings open, but the monarch rests with its wings closed. So, Something that we learned in grammar school, safety in numbers. Like maybe you mentioned that, and um, if they stay together, they're a lot safer. The one butterfly, one or two butterflies I've seen eaten in the grove, left the safety of the cluster, went lollyganging around, and along came a bird and got them. Because birds like to catch a butterfly on the fly. Birds don't catch a butterfly. Birds can't go up and hover in front of a cluster and say, oh, there's one. Uh, a hummingbird can do that, but hummingbirds don't eat butterflies. And, you know, a lot of birds eat seeds, so, so not every bird is interested in the butterflies. And we'll talk about why they're not interested in the butterflies when we talk about uh, milkweed. So safety in numbers, you'll notice how the wings are facing down. And that reminds me of the shingles on the roof of my house. And what happens when it rains? Those shingles sheet off the water, you know? The same thing is going on in the clusters with the wings hanging down, pressed together very closely. They're protecting their core. That's where the big muscles are attached to the thorax, the wing muscles and the legs, and they're keeping the core part as dry as possible, and, and also so they'll be ready to fly when it does warm up. Count the big cluster. We are counting now with Cal Poly in the state park as a scientist, and they, <coughs> it's, a, it's an estimation using binoculars with two people working together. Like if we're working together, um, we're going to look just at this cluster and we're not going to do one, two, three because these are wrapped all the way around. It's just, it's dimensional. So we're going to count more 25, 50, 75, 100. It's going to be more than that. And you're going to say, well, Peggy, I got 125 and I say, well, I got 150 and so we're going to pick 140 and put that down. And then we move on to the next cluster. I don't, well, yeah, you know, the clusters, um, George, get bigger usually as the season goes on. Earlier in the season, there's many clusters and they're smaller. And something happens as we get more into winter, the clusters seem to get more dense and there are fewer of them. So let's look at a bigger cluster. Oh. Wow. Yes. I was wondering, going back to George's question, 
small, you know, how you would possibly get an A, and yeah. how many is in that particular cluster? Well, I can tell you after, like I've been working at the Grove for nine years, and your eye gets pretty educated. Like I could tell when we had about 10,000, and I could tell it doubled because the butterflies start to come in and there aren't that many, and then every day more and more arrive up until about the third week of December. So the clusters do get bigger and bigger. And then, you know, people are counting them monthly. You know, we can see how that changes. But this, I don't know, all bets are off with that cluster. I, I just, they were all there. But look how camouflage they are, you know? And right at hole nine, okay? <laughs> now, this is something else that this brings us to a discussion of, of, of a color in nature. We talked about the drab color of the wings when they're closed. Now we see the orange color of the wings when they're open. And what does orange, when you see orange on an insect or a salamander or a snake, orange or red, what does that mean? Poison. Poison, Poison. stay away. And, um, We'll talk a little bit more about that. It's because of the toxic chemical in the um, milkweed that the caterpillar eats that's actually transferred to the adult butterfly through the, through the metamorphosis. Okay, so the butterfly is showing a warning color. This is the equivalent of sunbathing. If we were sunbathing out on the beach and asleep, we would be vulnerable. The butterfly is vulnerable. Perhaps it's it's warming up. It's not quite 55 degrees. It you know it, it maybe can fly maybe a little bit. Um, so these wings are oriented right to the direction of the sun. That's how well adapted it is to warming up. And um, so we call this thermal regulation. It's just sunbathing. We would call it sunbathing, going out and sitting and having, having a, cup of, a cup of coffee in the sun. And there they are. By the way, the butterflies don't have a mouth, so they're not eating the leaves. That's a Australian tortoise beetle that is unique to eating. Um, a lot of the trees are being affected along the coast of California, and that beetle does have a mouth. So that's the, the damage from them. You can see it here. It's not the butterflies. Okay. Just a, another one of my pictures. I mean, people think that clusters look like stained glass sometimes. And here again, you see them with the wings closed. Okay. Maybe. Okay. The butterflies, we know that overwintering is over when uh, mating starts. And I certainly would like to invite you all down to the butterfly grove around Valentine's Day. Because it is a very romantic place to be. In fact, I would say it's downright sexy. <laughs> it's a big job for these tired, hungry butterflies that flew to the grove. They've overwintered for four months. Now they've got to find a mate. But I don't know if someone mentioned this, but in the cluster, isn't it interesting what Mother Nature has done for the monarchs? Every other butterfly is a male or a female. So these tired, hungry butterflies that have already lived five months don't have to fly up to a Tascadero or Avila to look for a mate. <laughs> or down to Santa Maria. It's just the butterfly right next to them. The whole thing about overwintering is conserving enough energy so you have, the butterfly has stamina to mate. Because, I don't know, George, if you've seen the mating, but the, the male will catch the female in the air and bring her down to the ground, as we see here. They do not mate on the ground. Some other butter butterflies do mate on the ground, but not the monarch. <laughs> This is why the male has to have a lot of energy left over. Um, they are going to get connected abdomen to abdomen, and the female is going to be facing away, and they're going to be connected together. So something has to happen, because the male is going to fly the female up to the honeymoon suite, high up into the eucalyptus grove, and 
that couple's going to stay there for 24 hours. So, pretty romantic couple. Anyway, finally the female will succumb to his charm, so to speak, and she will fold her wings in. And that's the, anyway, the only way he can take her on the matrimonial flight and get her up to high up in the eucalyptus tree. We never see them anymore. When, when he takes off, it's like a heavy jet carrying another heavy jet behind it, and he has to circle around, get altitude, and then go up into the trees. And so they will do that um, maybe three to five times, and um, it is thought by the researchers that the female absorbs the spermatophore from the male the first several matings, that those that, that the, the spermatophore that isn't the fertilization material that is used for her eggs. It is the last male that she mates with that actually she stores the spermatophore in a little pouch, a little bursa, uh, inside her abdomen. And I'll talk about how the <laughs> eggs are fertilized in a minute. But um, so anyway, she's using the liquids from the first couple of males just to sustain her because she's the one who has to fly all around, deposit 300 eggs, look for milkweed, go from plant to plant. And for those of us who have been through birthing, it's a big job. Just imagine 300. You know? So luckily, she doesn't have to raise them all. Yes. Pardon me? Well, the, the male has done his job at that point. And I'm not saying that we ever go out into the grove and we find dead males on the ground. But as the mating goes on, the females start to leave and we find mainly males left in the grove. And they start leaving also and they do die after that. The female is going to die after she lays as many eggs as possible in the next three weeks. And that's why it's so important for her to find milkweed after she leaves the grove for the population to sustain. No milkweed, no monarchs. It's as simple as that, okay? This is what the tiny egg looks like, except it's really upside down because something really amazing about this butterfly, another adaptation, is that when the female leaves the, <clears throat> leaves the grove, she's going to fly out looking for milkweed, and this is a a type of tropical milkweed, it's not a native, and she can detect that she's found a milkweed plant from some distance away. And her antenna will be forward and she's going to think, oh, I think, I think that's a monarch. I'm going to land. And she lands and butterflies have tasters in the bottom of their feet, like a little mobile laboratory. <laughs> And she lands on the plant and she can further tell and confirm that it is milkweed. And then she's going to do something very, very interesting. She's going to wrap her abdomen around the bottom of the leaf. And she's going to paste this creamy little egg on the bottom of the leaf. Now isn't that an interesting adaptation? A predator flies over, what do they see? Nothing. No eggs. Well, also, if other butterflies fly over and there aren't many milkweed plants, what do they see? They don't see any eggs, so they might lay eggs. We might have 50 eggs on a, on a plant like this. And guess what? Maybe one caterpillar will make it, one or two. So we need a lot of milkweed, so the female can deposit just one egg per plant. Because the hungry little caterpillar that will, get, will hatch out is going to become a big caterpillar and it will eat 22 leaves on a plant. So looking at this plant, maybe we could support two caterpillars, maybe possibly a third one if the average caterpillar ate 22 leaves. So they become very big and healthy. Now we've got something else going on here with the color. What does black and yellow mean in nature? Any thoughts about that? Danger. Danger. There's an old saying, black and yellow, watch out, fellow. 
So these are warning colors also. But another, so, he, so the caterpillar is war, warning other predators away. Yes? When, where are they laying the eggs? Are they getting a distance from the coast or are they staying in the area? They're not staying in the coastal strand area. They are, they are, we'll say, motivated or adapted to go inland and north. And basically what they're doing is they're following the emergence of flowers. So when we think back to that map we had at the beginning and we saw the arrows going up, in the spring, flowers are detected first in the south, like down in San Diego, they would have flowers before we would have. And then later on, the flowers are emerging uh, up north, and that's pulling the butterflies with them. They're following the emergence of the flowers, which includes the milkweed. So they could find milkweed within a mile or so of the grove. Two miles, three miles, Lake Lopez. They go right out Lopez Boulevard to head up to the dam. There's a milkweed out there. Um, Laguna Lake. You all have plenty, a lot of milkweed out here in the foothills and the wild areas. So, and a lot of people are planting milkweed. So I want you to take a look at this um, caterpillar because it is upside down. And frequently, almost all the time, we see the caterpillar eating the leaf from underneath. Another adaptation, a way to stay alive and to hide from the predators, plus the warning colors. Now, the warning colors come from the fact that this plant, milkweed, has a toxic chemical in it called cardiac glycoside. And that word cardiac tells you the part of the body that it would affect mm -hmm. if a predator ate it. And so there's only about four birds that have adapted to be able to eat a monarch without getting sick. There's been many tests, a famous one with the blue jay, where they fed a monarch to the blue jay, and the blue jay immediately started to vomit. So there are the, mock the mockingbird is one bird that can eat a monarch. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll shake off the leaves, and because inside, is a lot of buttery substance, and the same in the abdomen of the butterfly, the sugar water converts to fat, and it's a nice buttery substance that they're, they're living on. So that's a good-sized caterpillar. Let's take a look at the next step. Uh, and this is kind of a time release of the caterpillar turning into a chrysalis. So it hangs upside down in a J position. It spins a little webby type thing, and with butterflies, it is a chrysalis. With moths, it is a cocoon, which is a spinning around. But this is actually the final shedding of the skin. They have an exoskeleton, and as the caterpillar grows, it has to shed its uh, skin. So it has room to grow more. So usually the eating phase is about two weeks. And the chrysalis phase, this, by the way, is just a minute. This happens very, very quickly. And then it stays like this for about two weeks. And that's the real magical part called metamorphosis, metamorph, change in form. We have something that was crawling with many little legs with a mouth changing into something that's beautiful with wings and long antenna and a proboscis and long legs. That's a total change in form, okay? And that's what metamorphosis is all about. And here we have the beautiful green chrysalis. This is unique just to the monarch butterfly. If you see a chrysalis like this, it's only going to produce a monarch butterfly. We call that enclosing. When the butterfly comes out, it's really not hatching. It's called eclosing. So it almost looks like a beautiful piece of jewelry. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's pretty ugly when it first comes out of the chrysalis. This is the abdomen, and it's filled with um, filled with liquid. Here's the proboscis right here. We've got the legs. This is, it's very important, you never want to disturb a butterfly when it's hanging upside down from the chrysalis because it, it needs to be upside down for everything to work and for the wings to pump up. The abdomen 
has liquid in it, and it's literally pumping the wings up until they become fully open, and then they dry in the sun. And after about four hours, if it's a nice sunny day, the butterfly can fly. It can sip nectar. It can mate. If it's a male, do everything it needs to do. But I'll tell you, if you find a butterfly coming out of a chrysalis at this stage, you won't even recognize that it's a butterfly. It's very unattractive. So finally, all the liquid disappears from the abdomen, goes into the rest of the butterfly through the wings. The wings harden, and those veins in the wings don't have liquid in them after they're, they're hardened. I wanted to show you what a handsome male looks like and how you can tell it's a man. We have these little spots right here. And those are pheromone spots. You might say that's where the male aftershave comes from. <laughs> and um, we don't think that they're using the pheromone spots to attract males in the butterfly grow because, remember, there's a male and a female right next to each other. But when they might use these pheromone spots, and what they would do is rub their wings together and scratch the spots open, and a very seductive aroma would come out that would be enticing to the female. And that's during the spring and summer, remember, when they're far removed from one another. They, they need all the help they can get. <laughs> so notice that the male has very thin veins. Now let's take a look at the next slide, and we'll see our beautiful female. We say that she has her mascara on. Notice how the veins are thicker and she doesn't have any little spots at the bottom. And um, so that's how, one of the ways you can tell the difference. If you're holding them uh, in your hands, you can tell other differences. But usually at the state park, we don't allow anyone to hold them, OK? So what can we do to help this monarch butterfly population that has declined 90%? Plant native milkweed. It's in the Asclepias family. This is not a native, but the only reason I can show it to you is because it isn't a native. All the natives are asleep right now. Um, the, they are um, deciduous, and they'll be coming back out in the spring. Milkweed, a native milkweed, is actually a spring, summer, warm weather plant. It needs six to eight hours of sunshine. It really loves full sun. Consider, even if you have a small home garden, you can use containers. I have the half wine barrels, and I had tremendous success. If you plant it, they will come, especially in an area like this. They'll either visit you on the way down or the way out of the grove, OK? Uh, consider gardens in your community. In fact, I was noticing this garden behind the, is that your garden? No, it's a community garden. Wow. We recommend uh, planting maybe six, seven milkweed plants together because then they'll make a nice area that the monarchs can sense. And um, I was really fortunate to work in a Royal Grande with uh, the Department of Public Works. I just called on them and I said, we need to do something to help the monarchs. I said, can we do something through Public Works? And do you have any property that we can use? And he said, well, let's get together. And we Googled all the property. They were very organized. And we picked Strother Park, Rancho Grande Park, and the historic Pauling House. And we did um, three monarch gardens and nectar gardens. We mixed the plants together. And we created monarch way stations where monarchs could stop along the way. And they were registered sites. And I can tell you, Arroyo Grande is extremely happy about it. And they're showing off these sites to everyone. And we had butterfly activity. All the milkweed was eaten down to the nub. And we cut it back, and it grew again. And it was eaten down again by the nub. We had hundreds of caterpillars. We had so many caterpillars, we were moving them from one site to another. So we also did the historic Price House, the San Luis uh, Lighthouse, and John Deere Irrigation uh, Company uh, uh, property on Traffic Way. They were all extremely successful. So that's an example of working with the community 
yes, it's fine to do something at our own houses, but if you can find a community project and I'm going to leave you my business card, I have someone growing a thousand narrow leaf milkweed plants for me right now. And they're going to be given to the Pismo docents and we're going to use them for community projects. So if you have any ideas, you can reach me through Joyce or I'll leave my business card today and I'd be happy to work with you. We can't plant it, especially in Atascadero, until the last freeze is over. We have to be like farmers and not put the plants out until then. Uh, Katie, do you know if deer eat milkweed? I live in a deer area. They eat a lot of stuff, but there's some things they will not touch. And because of the toxins in the milkweed, might that keep deer from eating them, or do you know? I, I don't know about the deer, but I can tell you there's a woman on the other side of the 101 that has native milkweed, and I'm sure there's deer, and she probably hasn't found too many dead, uh, you know, deer around. It killed the really <laughs> big animals. Uh, you'd have to eat a whole lot. I have heard, like, if you had horses in a corral, and you were starving the horses and you weren't feeding them on a daily basis and a milkweed came up, they would, they would eat it. But if you're taking care of your animals or if the native animals are well fed, they're probably not going to bother it. I don't think we've ever had deer eat our plants. Okay, and you, you have the other things. Around our mm -hmm. Right, so consider perhaps it's something that the ladies group would want to do here to help nature, help this, it's a spiritual insect. It has the metamorphosis, has a lot of religious overtones to it. It's a beautiful insect. It has been considered an indicator species, which means it indicates the health of the environment. And guess what? When an indicator species goes down 90%, it's telling us something about our environment. If you can't plant milkweed, it does get very, pretty large. Um, then consider nectar plants. Butterflies love purple, orange, yellow. Plant any of those and you will have a variety of butterflies, you'll have hummingbirds, other insects. This is just what Strutter Park, uh, we worked around the sign. We have nectar plants um, and we had um, milkweed on both sides of the sign. And, it went, and this because of our lovely weather, this lasted into late October, flowering. So that's just one of the areas that we did. So I certainly would love to have you all come down to the Butterfly Grove, and um, especially around Valentine's Day. The butterflies will be gone towards the end of February, depending upon the weather, and then we'll have to wait to see them another year. Uh, I want to thank you so much for inviting me here today and talking with you about the special characteristics, the overwintering, the migration, the special behaviors in the grove, and this unique relationship and what it does for the monarchs uh, with milkweed. Um, do we have time for just a couple of questions? Or? And what questions do you have? Yes. You had mentioned something about him drinking or keeping in sweet water. The sweet water is the nectar in the plants. That's really sugar water. And so that's where they get it. Do you put sugar water out for You know, I went to a class at um, the Botanical Garden, and they said if you're doing a butterfly garden, you can do a shallow bowl, stick it in the ground, and put rocks in it, and you could keep some water in it. But we don't do anything like that at the Butterfly Grove. They usually can find, um, they can find sips of water or sips of nectar when they need it. Yes? Uh, with the heavy rain we've had and will continue to have, we hope, at Plown, um, hasn't that been somewhat devastating to them? Doesn't it knock them down? It can knock them down, but um, Boy, ours move from one area to another. They, you know, they, they breathe through spiracles, holes. They, you know how we can tell something is going on through our nose and from our, our mouth? We can tell there's moisture in the air. Just think of an insect with little holes along the side, that they're probably receiving data that something is going on and it might motivate them to move to a safer area in the grove.
That's what we found. But it can be devastating. We can find them on the ground. And if the sun comes up the next morning and they dry out and warm up, they can fly back up into the cluster. Yes. Um, my kind of question, but we have readers here. Barbara King Solomon, about four or five yes. years ago, wrote a book called Flight Behavior. It's not a quick read. Mm -hmm. no. But she's talking about the effect of the environment on um, the barnacles. So it's a wonderful book. Her background is a biologist. Yes. And that came through. It's a great book, and, and you know, a lot of people didn't like it as a book, but I liked it from the science and what she, the research, is the same research that we do, and all the people that she talked about in the book are real people and real researchers. That's our book club for this month. Oh, good. Next Thursday night. Okay. Come. <laughs> good timing. Yes. Uh, when they move to a different side, it, it's not like bees, is it, where they all kind of go at once? Um, you know, there isn't a queen bee butterfly. So when they're triggered to move, they're just all triggered to move at once. The females will leave the overwintering grove first. But it's not one female that says, okay, girls, let's go. I'm looking for the milkweed. They all just start going. It's time. They've made it and it's time to go. Um, we don't know if there's any communication. There seems to be a lot of wing flapping going on in the clusters. And, um, you know, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a leader in, in the group. Young, new butterflies, if they're flying looking for an overwintering group, they will see the orange in the trees, and that might attract them down to overwinter in the same place. Okay, they do recognize each other by color. No, uh, this the variety of milkweed is what they really prefer. They love this. That's, I have it. This is what I grow because you can buy it in a nursery. I also have two other varieties of milkweed that I bought locally, but they sell them also miners and they laurel <coughs> sell this. Uh, if you have the varieties, they'll go to that. <laughs> yeah, but, but if you don't have this and you, you have, have the that, other varieties, yeah. they'll go to the other varieties. Right. We suggest if you grow the non-native. This is a tropical, and we think that these are tropical butterflies, so that's one reason they would be so well adapted to finding this and going to it. It should be cut back at this time of the year, okay, because now the butterflies are in the grove, resting, they're not laying eggs. I, mine usually dies out right now, it's all dead, and I've cut out and pulled out ones, because right. I haven't had any luck coming up from the roots. They do reseed very easily. So yes, they they, do. these plants and I have seeds with me if somebody wants some. Okay. But uh, it will recede. But it, this variety likes nice good soil. It'll it'll only grow in my pots and never grows in the rocky pathway that it's sandy. It likes potting soil. Yeah. Yeah. Well you have to experiment. Yeah. I mean uh, we never have this, this much milkweed in a royal grande as we have now. We've got everybody growing milkweed, and that you know that's what people are doing. So we're learning from that experience. But I will have small plants, so if anyone wants to contact me, they can certainly do that, and let's work on a project together. So I want to thank you very much for your attention and your invitation, and I enjoy being here. And I'll be available during lunch to chat with you. Thank you.